Here's what should be a simple question. How do we know what medicines and treatments even work? In recent months, I've been struck by how people try to make sense about the conflicting information about this. They've seen evidence that the mainstream media isn't a reliable guide for all sorts of reasons, but some of the alternatives are equally or sometimes even more dubious. What are the principles behind how we know what works? What are the seductive traps that we fall into, sometimes that the pharmaceutical companies and others try to push us into? And how do we really tell the difference between science and pseudoscience when it comes to medicine? It's all rather topical, let's dive straight in. In the historical world, your best chance of staying alive probably involved avoiding doctors, because what they recommended was every bit as likely to kill you as it was to cure you, even in the relatively modern era. The paediatrician Dr Benjamin Spock, for instance, wrote a bestseller on baby care published in 1946 that confidently recommended that babies should sleep on their front. We now know that was wrong and it probably led to thousands of otherwise preventable cot deaths. He was a modern influencer. Were he alive today, no doubt he would have been on YouTube. But there are more dramatic and longer lasting practices than that. For instance, take the practice of bloodletting where you would open the vein of an ill person and let the blood flow out into some receptacle or another. The practice is thought to have originated in ancient Egypt. By the time we got to medieval Europe, it was used for people suffering from all sorts of conditions, including plague, smallpox, epilepsy and gout. And it probably did for America's first president. George Washington was ill on December 13th, 1799. He was bled by physicians who removed an estimated five to seven pints of blood in less than 16 hours. That may or may not have resulted in his death, but it surely didn't help. This we now know for sure. So how could a practice that was actually useless in most cases and potentially harmful in some had been practiced for around 3,000 years? Well, first, because early philosophers and doctors came up with beliefs around the causes of disease that we now know to be completely wrong, but also because doctors who used the practice would swear that it was beneficial. You often hear people ask today, rhetorically, why don't you ask the doctors on the ground? Well, there were plenty of doctors on the ground who swore by bloodletting. Dr Benjamin Rush was one, tirelessly dedicated to eradicating illness. He believed that all febrile diseases were due to an irregular convulsive action of the blood vessels. So that directed all of his remedies and he was known as a particularly enthusiastic bloodletter. He was totally convinced he saw the results of his actions every day. He wrote this... I began by drawing a small quantity at a time. The appearance of the blood and its effects upon the system satisfied me of its safety and efficacy. Never before did I experience such sublime joy as I now felt in contemplating the success of my remedies. It repaid me for all the toils and studies of my life. The conquest of this formidable disease was the triumph of a principle of medicine. And he was just one of many who, as some began to grow sceptical and critical in the 18th century, defended the practice with the authority of all their years of experience. Which is, you know, why we try to disregard arguments from authority today. Don't tell me about your years in practice. Let's talk about the evidence. But that wasn't the way of the era. Now, it began to be challenged more rigorously in the 19th century as the first practitioners started to make use of the emerging field of statistics. Pierre Louis, often described as the founder of medical statistics, looked at the figures and concluded there was no convincing evidence supporting bloodletting. John Hughes Bennett carried out a statistical analysis of survival rates from an instance of pneumonia in Europe and America where he compared groups that had treatment and groups that didn't. That study wouldn't have met the conditions of a modern clinical study, but it was sufficient to highlight the lack of supportive evidence. In spite of that, the medical profession was slow to respond to Louis and Hughes Bennett. 
Different practitioners began to agree that, well, you know, maybe it had been used wrongly in the past, but for certain conditions, and if done at a very early stage and with very precise quantities of blood extracted, then it was obviously beneficial. Now, you'll hear identical responses to mounting data today when people argue that certain studies were wrong because they didn't use the right dose, didn't treat people early enough, and so on and so on. They are traditional responses to the growing evidence looking for exceptions and loopholes to support the practitioner's original beliefs. The practice gradually declined. Ultimately, it mostly disappeared once the era of antibiotics arrived and science had progressed to a better understanding of the causes of disease. So did people then immediately get the need for what we now describe as evidence-based medicine? No, because people trust their intuition and our psychology is such that it can play all sorts of tricks on us. I mean, how could we have believed for so long that bloodletting was effective when it wasn't in the slightest? Didn't all those doctors on the ground detect that? Largely, it comes down to what statisticians would describe as the regression to the mean. The mean is the standard way things are, and illnesses tend to have a natural history where you feel bad and then gradually you feel better, feel the way you normally do, the regression back to the mean. If someone is ill from something that won't actually kill them, then in due course, probably they will get better. Now, if they get better, and purely coincidentally, the doctor gave them a treatment of bloodletting, then the doctor is convinced that it was the bloodletting that made them better. And if they gave them homeopathic remedies, the doctor, in inverted commas in that case, will be convinced that homeopathy made them better. And if they sacrificed a pigeon, and the patient wore its tail feathers as earrings, Well, you get the general idea. Because of our psychological desire to be right, we strongly look for information that supports our prior beliefs and filter out the contrary evidence. So through history, doctors have seen people die in spite of their treatment, but they've seen people recover because of their treatment. Most of the time, what they were seeing was the body of their patients regressing to the mean, going back to the normal state. Voltaire once said, The art of medicine consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Or at least, you know, not killing the patient would be good. We have now moved beyond that. We know a lot more. We can be useful. But we still struggle with the discipline to be clear about what we do and what we don't know. Archie Cochrane, one of the founding fathers of evidence-based medicine, questioned the standard process of how doctors decided to treat disease based on their personal opinion, which they believed to be informed by years of experience. Instead, he argued that decisions should be based on evidence and particularly randomised controlled trials. He described once how he knew different groups of surgeons who were passionately swearing to him that their treatment for cancer was the most effective. They were utterly convinced that the facts supported their case. He brought a collection of them together in the same room so that they could see just how passionately, inflexibly certain all the others were in their differing views, seeking to persuade them that since they couldn't all be right, then something more concrete was needed to get to the truth. And that was an uphill struggle, because in that situation, people tend to continue to think that their certainty is knowledge and everyone else's certainty is delusion. And so, of course, we now conduct clinical trials where one group of patients receives a particular treatment, which is the focus of the study, and another group receives either a placebo or receives the currently standard treatment. The placebo, which is just a sugar pill, is given because we know that human psychology is amazing And the mere fact of being given something that you believe might be a cure will have a beneficial effect in many circumstances. Which is another reason why you can't depend on anecdote. Give someone an entirely useless sugar pill, tell them it's a powerful medicine for their condition, and a number of people will swear that they feel better. And they will feel better. Or at least they feel some benefit. So you have to be able to show that your drug is actually effective, better than the mind fooling itself with something that it believes to be true, but isn't. 
hence why placebos are given. But then of course if you're treating a serious disease and an existing treatment already helps then it would be unethical to have a group that was given no real medication at all. In that case you're not carrying out a study to find out whether something works at all, you're trying to work out whether it works better than the existing treatments. But the placebo effect is a key factor here because it's one reason why you have to make sure that studies are blind. If the researchers knew which patients were getting which treatment, they might not be able to help themselves from giving the game away. And there are other subtle things that they could do, sometimes in all innocence, that would pollute the trial. So Ben Goldacre, in his book Bad Science, described it like this. Let's say I'm doing a study on a medical pill designed to reduce high blood pressure. I know which of my patients are having the expensive new blood pressure pill and which are having the placebo. One of the people on the swanky new blood pressure pills comes in and has a blood pressure reading that is way off the scale, much higher than I would have expected, especially since they're on this expensive new drug. So I recheck their blood pressure just to be sure I didn't make a mistake. The next result is more normal, so I write that one down and ignore the high one. It's the sort of thing you wouldn't even notice yourself doing, but it means you're now providing a different level of error correction to one side of the trial than you are to the other. If you don't know who's getting what, then measurement errors have no reason to favour one side or the other. Does it really make a difference? Well, one study found that trials with inadequate blinding exaggerated the benefits of the treatments being studied by 17%. Other studies since that one have found similar results, so this isn't some obscure nitpicking done to annoy the doctors on the ground, it makes a significant difference. The same principle also dictates that the people who go into each group should be selected at random, so that there's no chance of the hopeful patients being put into the study group and the hopeless patients being put into the placebo group. And it makes a difference how the randomization is done. If you randomise people in, for instance, the order in which they're recruited onto the study, you could end up deciding not to recruit that no-hoper because you don't think they're going to benefit. But then if the next available slot is for the placebo group, you might be more inclined to do so. So the proper methods of randomization go to some lengths to avoid the risk of bias. One common one is that people who have already all signed onto the trial are asked to call a special telephone number where someone has a computerized randomization program. Again, studies have been done on the impact of randomization on the outcomes of trials. Informal methods of randomization have been found to overestimate treatment effects by 41%. Quite a lot of low quality studies just don't disclose what randomization was carried out. And those trials have been found likewise to overstate the effects by 30%. So the absence of a proper description about how they did the study is likewise a red flag. I mean, let's face it, if you go to all the trouble to follow a really ironclad randomization process, you're probably going to take the time to say so in your write-up. This is why tools were developed to be able to rank the quality of studies. So there's the JADAD score, a seven point tick list that includes questions on things like whether they described the method of randomization. And there's the Cochrane risk of bias tool. And all of those things can make a difference in knowing how much weight to place on a specific study or trial. One initiative that's helped us focus on all of this is the Cochrane Collaboration, now just known as Cochrane. And yes, it was named after Archie Cochrane, who we've already met, because it was a response to his call for up-to-date systematic reviews of randomised control trials. It carries out systematic reviews of different drugs and procedures, amongst other things, and publishes them in the Cochrane Library. Its logo is a simplified forest plot, a graph of the results of a meta-analysis, a study that groups numerous other studies together to produce a larger sample and to see whether collectively an effect becomes obvious that wasn't so in the individual smaller studies. And indeed it represents a very specific forest plot, one which was carried out for a landmark meta-analysis that looked into the value of giving corticosteroids to pregnant mothers. This was an example of a treatment that gave benefit, but because the various small studies that had been done hadn't been properly consolidated, it didn't get noticed. 
There had been seven trials testing it out between 1972 and 1981. Two of them showed some benefit from the steroids. Five others didn't show any real benefit, hence why it wasn't taken up. But the meta-analysis was carried out a few years later by Crowley et al. that pulled all of those studies together and it showed that in fact there was strong evidence for corticosteroids reducing the risk of babies dying in a premature birth. So babies died before that meta-analysis was done because a treatment wasn't known to be effective even though the various studies that proved its effectiveness had already been done. Not everybody gets such happy news from the meta-analyses, of course. One thorough meta-analysis of homeopathy trials found overall that it performed no better than a placebo. The homeopathy community claimed, of course, that it was a stitch-up because it excluded the trials that showed the biggest benefit. Those were the trials, of course, that failed the quality slash bias filter, which you might presume is not unconnected as to why they showed strong positive effects. Now, some people make the argument if a treatment is shown not to be actually harmful and given the positive power that we know for sure exists in the placebo effect, then what's the harm in letting people prescribe medicine like homeopathy since it might help and it won't hurt? Well, unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. Believing in things that have no evidence can have plenty of negative outcomes. It may have the outcome of medicalising problems, the cause of which are elsewhere. Convincing you that something that actually arises from, say, a social problem is actually something that can be solved with a pill. But then there's also the culture of storytelling that comes with the placebo effect. For placebos like homeopathy to work, they come with a whole backstory that helps you to see high value in what you're being offered. And that often comes at the expense of something else. Homeopaths, for instance, have a routine marketing practice of denigrating mainstream medicine. Now, of course, there are valid reasons to be a little wary of mainstream medicine. We'll come to some of those in a moment. But if you can turn those into a rejection of the entire system, then you're more likely to embrace those presenting themselves as the alternative. So, for instance, investigations have frequently found numerous homeopathy practitioners advising against the MMR vaccine for children. A BBC Newsnight programme found that a majority of the homeopaths it approached recommended homeopathic remedies against malaria, advising against proven malaria prophylactics. So, yes, there are people who just want to get the answer that they like. To do that, they'll ignore trials they don't like, promote bad trials that they do, misrepresent the results of trials, dramatise them, and if they have the power to, manipulate how they're carried out or communicated, and they will then tell you what you should be taking. So it's not enough simply to take a trial on face value. You actually have to look at the methods used and the detail of how the study was carried out. And it's not just homeopaths and snake oil salesmen who might want to misrepresent studies. After all, a significant number of trials taking place now are driven by drug companies seeking to prove the benefit of their planned new products. With huge amounts of money at stake, you can bet that a lot of study misrepresentation is likely to go on. For one thing, you have to be wary as to whether what they're studying is even a problem at all. If a pharmaceutical company can't find new treatments for well-known diseases, well, they might just instead focus on treatments for observable phenomena that aren't actually a medical disease at all. Again, in his book Bad Science, Ben Goldacre gives the examples of social anxiety disorder, which was found as a new use for SSRI drugs. Female sexual dysfunction, some of which used to be the common observation that on average women tend to have a lower sex drive than men, plus sometimes, you know, are tired and stressed and can't be bothered. Well, it's now a condition with a treatment, Viagra for women. But we're back to one side. Pharma will definitely want trials to show that their product works. And they've been known to try to twist trials to fit the results and to threaten to sue academics or practitioners who have spotted that something doesn't work quite as well as they say that it does. Seeing how they do that is important to understanding the reason why quality checks in studies are needed. First of all, why do we even let the drug companies run trials? I mean, wouldn't it solve all the problems if trials were run independently and the companies didn't have any influence? Yes, it would. Does come at a cost, though. 
Figures in the UK show that the clinical research industry is worth £2.7 billion per year, of which £1.5 billion, around 55%, comes from commercial sources. You can see from that how much private corporations get to have influence over what gets researched and how. A recent topical example, and one that I've talked about here, Merck, the original owner of the now expired patent on ivermectin, they could have elected to run trials on that drug in relation to COVID-19, but chose not to. It's running trials instead on a novel drug that will be sold at a relatively high price and will be patent protected. Now, whether ivermectin turns out to have value for COVID-19 or not, the point is that decision was taken by a commercial entity. We don't know its motive, but it was certainly an act that was consistent with a self-interested commercial decision. Now, what else do drug companies do to maximise the chances that, you know, their not especially great drug might come back with nevertheless great results? One thing is in the selection who takes part. Different people respond differently to drugs. Old people with lots of existing medication for existing conditions are often less responsive. Younger people with just one ailment much more likely to show an improvement. But of course that older age group may well be the most likely patients for whom the drug is going to get prescribed. Next, even if there's already a competitor drug on the market, run a trial against a placebo if you can. It'll give you better results, better looking graphs. If you have to compare your drug against that of a competitor, then you could see if you could get away with using an inadequate dose of a competing drug so it doesn't do so well, or alternatively use a very high dose of a competing drug so that its side effects are more pronounced and more problematic. Keep those details hidden in the footnotes where you hope that no one's going to notice them. This is an approach that Ben Goldacre points out was taken, for instance, with the SSRI antidepressants compared to the older antipsychotic drugs. Another thing you could do is restrict the potential side effects that you ask about or be very deliberate about how you ask about them. Those SSRI antidepressants are known to cause sexual side effects, including the inability to experience orgasm, which some people apparently think might be an important side effect you'd probably want to know about. Yes! Yes! But if you ask people a casual, open-ended question about side effects they've noticed, without listing possible ones to prompt them, how many patients are going to make the connection between the drug trial and what may have been happening recently in their sex lives? Probably significantly fewer than might have actually experienced that side effect and would remember it if prompted. You can do things like be selective about how you set your baseline. If at the start of your trial your placebo group is doing better than your study group, then you would adjust the baseline so that the impact of the group is on a level playing field. But you know, if it's the other way round, the study group's doing better, well, you could just leave that baseline alone. You can ignore dropouts. Now, people who drop out of trials are much more likely to have been doing badly and suffering side effects, which is why they drop out. So if you ignore them, don't chase them up, don't include them in the final analysis, it will improve the results significantly. And then you can decide to end your study at the point where the data is looking really good, even if the original plan was to run it for months longer. Because, you know, things might start to even out if you carry on, so why take the risk? You can decide to delete obvious outliers that seem to be anomalies if they make your product look bad. But of course, you can leave in the outliers that if they make your product look good. So, I mean, that's committing fraud, by the way, on the data. But it's under the cover of cleaning the data up, removing anomalies and so on. And if the results are completely negative, well, you could just not publish them. Do some more research, hoping for some mediocre positive results by sheer chance that you could then fold the poorer ones into. If you have to publish them, then publish them in an obscure journal. Say that the data is available on request. Obviously, if the results are positive, then you forget all that. You go for the biggest, the most prestigious journal you can. Get all of that detail proudly on show. A lot of these techniques are subtle, hard to detect but the aggregate effect can be measured. This study by Lex Chin et al. showed that although the industry-funded studies were not considered to be lower quality studies in any measurable way, they were nevertheless four times more likely to give results that were more favourable to the company than independent studies. A lot of that is likely to come down simply to publication bias. 
positive trials are more likely to get published. This is why meta-analyses now use this tool, a v-funnel plot. The positivity of a result goes on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you have a measure relating to the quality and the size of the study. If there's no publication bias, you should see an even spread with the high quality trials all clustered around each other at the top and the lower quality ones spread out roughly evenly to both sides at the bottom. If there's publication bias, then it will be skewed to the positive side because the poorer quality negative trials are missing. So these are some of the problems. Do we have any hope? What can we do? One of the solutions to all of these problems is to require studies to pre-register. So they talk about how many people they've recruited onto the study, what are the objectives of the study, what are going to be the key measures, what's the evidence that it's looking for. If you register all of those things in advance, then a lot of the post-study tricks where you cherry pick the different measures that show something and you drop the outliers, those become more difficult to do, it becomes more transparent. None of this is helped by the fact that the mainstream media will seek out the dramatic over the important. They will elevate figures of dubious standing if they fit a particular story and worse. The media is an industry mostly made up of humanities graduates who know nothing about statistical analysis. And that's a reality that companies, campaigners and snake oil salesmen alike have all had some success in manipulating. For the rest of us who just want to know the truth about what the evidence does or doesn't say, we have little choice but to look beyond the headlines, look beyond the wild claims of the advocates and the corporations and try to understand the process. And simply to bear in mind, when big claims are supported by just one or two small studies, that's not yet a weight of evidence you can lean on. Always be sceptical. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.